scientist. Let's uh, talk about the SSH reactor. Uh, I think you guys are ready. Okay, so uh, we start to talk about particular types of reactions, and uh, this week we've talked about precipitation reactions. Today we'll talk about uh, acid base reactions. And on Monday, we will touch on redox reactions. Okay? Next Wednesday is a very funny day. Um, I'm not sure if everybody will be here, but we will have a lecture scheduled. Okay? So, and I will not introduce new material, but I'll go through some uh, of the previous topics and point out some, some interesting uh, Point that you may find interesting in terms of uh, practicing for exams and so on. Okay, so today, acid base reactions. Um, this is a very important class of chemical reactions, and so we have to know about them. So um, it deals, of course, with acids and bases. These are just chemical compounds, and they have acidic or basic properties. So let's, let's look at a couple of examples and try to understand what are acids and what are bases. Okay? Acids are molecules or compounds that can give off an H plus, okay, a proton in solution. And this is one, uh, one example. This is a very interesting mo molecule. This is cytic acid. Cytic acid is an acid because this H can split off and go in solution. And then you have a proton that is fully dissolved in water and hence it is acidic. So the concentration of protons defines how acidic a solution is. Another example is uh, acetic acid. That is the acetic, acetic component in vinegar. This H will split off. Okay? Uh, HCl, hydrochloric acid, we've seen it several times. Of course it's an acid because this H is fully dissociated from the Cl and hence you have H plus in solution, and that is the definition of an acid. Mm -hmm. On the other side, we have bases. Ammonia, we've seen already, that's a base. Why is that a base? Because it can actually accept an H plus. Okay, and so one definition of an, an base is that it can accept protons. We'll see that spelled out on the next slide. Here's another one. This is um, baking soda. It's also a base. Okay, so this ion here can accept another H plus, and that's why it's basic. And then finally, uh, this is uh, NaOH, sodium hydroxide, uh, or caustic soda. And this OH, of course, is highly basic. It is very happy to accept an H plus in solution. Okay, so these are very common materials. You, know, uh, you may have one of these things in your kitchen currently, and so, uh, relevant chemicals and we have to understand how they react and why they react and what quantities they react. Okay, so let's uh, look a little closer and come to a certain definition that we can use in this course. An acid we can define as a proton donor. Okay, meaning that this H here, that guy, can split off from the compound and can be freely floating in solution. The base, on the other hand, can accept such protons. So there it is. So effectively what you have, this is kind of an acid-base reaction, you have an acid that gives off an H plus and a base that accepts of H plus. And binds it. Okay. So this is one definition of an acid and a base. There's more definitions, but for this particular course, Chem 1P will use this definition, the Bernstadt Lowry definition of acids and bases. And the definition is really uh, what the graph is all about. An acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. Okay. Very useful definition. But you'll see, chemistry will see, there's more definitions of what an acid or a base can be. Okay. Now, if you remember, we've seen several types of acids and bases already. And uh, when we talked about strong and weak electrolytes, we saw that some of them are strong, other ones are weak acids, or strong and weak bases. So let me 
uh, summarize that once again because it's going to be important for this discussion. Okay? So strong acids were those acids that completely dissociate into H pluses and the corresponding NA. Mm -hmm. Okay? Example is here, hydrobromic acid. Hydrobromic acid is fully dissociating into H plus and the corresponding anion is Br minus. Mm -hmm. There is no HBr left. Everything is split. In other words, this reaction in this direction is highly unlikely. The back of the reaction is highly unlikely. And we have already seen that there are six main strong acids. Okay? And here they are. Hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, nitric acid, uh, perchloric acid, and sulfuric acid. Those are the acids that are classified as strong. So it also implies that if you see an acid that is not part of this list, you have a problem. You're tired. You're tired. If it's not part of this list, you can actually interpret it as a weak acid. So the weak acids are those acids that do not fully dissociate into H plus. And, and, you know, and the corresponding anions, meaning that there's a likelihood that the H plus will go back to the anion and make a neutral compound again, or the original compound. Okay, let's give an example. This is uh, acetic acid. This H can split off. We have seen this example already. Mm -hmm. This H can split off, okay, producing H plus as in solution, and it is an acid. This is the acetate anion. But the acetate anion can accept the H plus once again and go back into this species, the original compound. Okay? So at all times, there's a portion that is always uh, in this neutral form, and then a portion that is split. Okay? So not everything is associated. Only part of it is. So basically, every other acid that's not part of this list can be classified as a weak acid. Just uh, let me give you some examples. The simplest uh, acid that contains, uh, that is basically a carboxylic acid, is uh, formic acid. Formic acid is the acidic compound in a uh, bee sting or uh, in an ant Okay, so that's the uh, simplest carboxylic acid. Acetic acid, this is uh, hydrocyanic acid, is also a weak acid. And uh, phosphoric acid, also a weak acid, it's not part of this list. Anything else is basically a weak acid. There are actually very, very strong acids beyond this, but we will not discuss those exotic cases. Okay, so we have strong acids and weak acids. We also have strong bases and weak bases. And so let's have a look at a couple of examples. Strong bases, of course, are those that fully dissolve, fully dissociate in solution to form OH minus in the aqueous solution. So the compound is fully dissociating such that it generates OH minus. Here's an example. This is uh, sodium hydroxide in water. It fully dissociates into sodium ion and hydroxide anions. And this Becker reaction is highly unlikely, it won't happen basically, under the saturation limit. So this is a very strong base. And um, Basically, most salts that contain the OH minus, the hydroxide anion, are strong bases because they generate directly OH minus. But there's more species that generate OH minus, and we've seen the example, of course, of <coughs> ammonia. Ammonia, sorry. This is the ammonia molecule. When it interacts with water, what it does, it can accept an H from the water, so it becomes NH4 plus. And the remnant, the water molecule that is now missing in H plus, becomes OH minus. And so effectively, you've generated OH minus in solution. And hence, ammonia is a base. It is not a base that contains OH minus already. Okay? But it does generate OH minus if you put it in solution. But of course, it's a weak, it's a weak base. That means that the backup reaction is taking place, and not all ammonia molecules are protonated into NH4+. Some of them will go back this way. Okay, 
Okay, so let's, uh, you know, we should be able to distinguish those four cases. Strong asset, weak asset, strong base, and weak base. Okay, so now we have these assets and bases. How do they react? Well, let's have a look at a, a particular reaction. Hydrochloric acid is reacting with potassium hydroxide. There it is. Hydrochloric acid in solution is H plus and CO minus, two ions that are fully dissolved. And potassium hydroxide are these ions, potassium plus and OH minus. So this is, I'm writing this out in terms of the complete aonic equation, right? So this is the acid, because this is the H plus, and the base in the solution is the OH minus, right? And so what will happen is, what do you think will happen? This H plus will go there, right? So they interact to form water, so the H plus will go to the OH minus to form water, and then these two guys are left. Nothing happens to them, they just stay in solution, okay? H plus and CO minus. They will stay in solution, will not form a new compound, and, though, and, and therefore these guys are called the spectator ions. So I can again uh, use the same trick that we learned about last time, cross out those spectator ions, and I'm left with a net ionic equation, which is H plus interact at OH minus to form H2O. This is the ba basic, the most fundamental acid base reaction. So you have H plus is in solution, interact with the OH minus is in solution, and they form a water molecule. This is the most fundamental acid base reaction. There's more types. This is the most fundamental. Okay. Now, if you have the very special situation that you have exactly the same amount of H plus as OH minus in solution, so the same amount of moles of H plus, and the same amount of OH minus, they will combine to form the water molecule. And if you do that, you have no H pluses and no H minuses left, and you have neutralized your solution. Okay? So a neutralization reaction is when the amount of base reacts exactly with the amount of acid in solution, neutralizing the acidity. There are technically no H pluses floating around in solution, all taken care of. And the solution is called neutral. Now you learn in the and see what neutral really means, okay? Neutral means there's no, all the H pluses are gone because you have to sell uh, deprotonation of water, but beyond that, all the H pluses are gone. So for all intents and purposes, if you consider the solution to be fully neutral. Let's look at another example. Here's one aqueous sodium hydroxide is reacting with. Acetic acid. Now, acetic acid is not a strong acid. This one is, right? This one is not. So here it is. This is the completely ionic equation again. Sodium ions, hydroxide ions, that are sodium hydroxide. This is acetic acid. Acetic acid is actually a compound, okay, where H is attached. This is a molecule that's dissolved in solution. So this aqueous means that it's in solution doesn't necessarily mean that it's split already. This OH likes to pluck out this H from acetic acid, okay? So this is the base, and that is the acid, and they interact very strongly. In other words, all the H's will be plucked away from this weak acid to form H2O. Sodium is the spectator, and the rest ion is the acetate ion. Now, interesting situation here. This was a strong acid and a strong base. Water is formed. This better reaction doesn't take place. Here I have a strong base and a weak acid. Does the backup reaction take place or not? Yes or no? What do you think? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Who thinks I don't know? I don't want to say anything. Good. All right. So. Uh, this is indeed a weak acid, and if there wouldn't be no OH in solution, there would be a reversible reaction. However, OH is a very, very strong base. It likes H pluses so much that it keeps nibbling away at this acetic acid, okay? Because it reacts very strongly with it. In other words, there is no backup reaction. 
because it is much less favorable to give up the H from the H to rho, stick it again to the acetate to form OH minus. OH minus will immediately go back this way. So as soon as you have a strong acid or a strong base in solution, the corresponding reaction will most likely be not reversible. Okay? Only if you have weak acids and weak bases, both, then you have a re reversibility. But as soon as you have a strong acid in there or a strong base, you can consider this reactor to be unidirectional. Okay? All the H pluses and OH minuses will be consumed. Okay, let's, uh, you know, let's say it one more time in a different way. We saw this uh, reaction on the previous slide. We saw HCl and uh, potassium hydroxide. Now I'm writing it in terms of the molecular equation. Okay, so this is just another way of writing the same equation. HCl is now written as a molecular compound. Aqueous means it's fully dissolved, right? KOH, aqueous is also fully dissolved. If you write it like this, and I've seen several people do this. Okay, don't write a plus here and a minus there, because this compound aqueous means it is it is already dissolved and it is understood that this is split. If you split it, you have to split both and put the aqueous sign with both. Don't smoosh it together and then squeeze a plus and a minus in there. This is not a proper way of writing this compound. You either split it fully or you leave them together without showing the charge. Okay, so we saw what happens. The H plus interacts with the OH, forming H2O, and KCl is the other compound that is still in solution, fully split, but in the molecular equation, they don't show that they're separate. We put them together without showing the charges, so the ions. Uh, molecular equation, this, is, this was the net unit equation. We concluded H plus, OH minus, H2O, all the rest ions are expected ions are taken care of. In a nutshell. Again, this is an example of a fundamental acid base reaction between H plus and OH minus. Okay, well, uh, let's look at one more example and try to write these equations correctly, and then we'll jump into doing some calculations with that. Okay, so uh, I have here a reaction. It is perchloric acid and it is interacting with magnesium hydroxide. Perchloric acid is a strong acid, and magnesium hydroxide is a very strong base, so this will definitely be a unidirectional reaction. The molecular equation, what I do is I'm going to write down the full compound. Okay? Perchloric acid is here, HClO4, aqueous. That is the molecular compound. Don't show the charges here, okay, once again. And this is magnesium hydroxide. Magnesium with two hydroxides attached because magnesium is two plus. So you need two hydroxides to make it neutral. Magnesium hydroxide happens to be a solid. That's not given here in the question, so but I put it here anyway. All right, what's happening? Well, this is OH minus. That's a strong base. The H plus, of course, is uh, interacting with it to form water. And the other two that are just still in solution are the magnesium ions and the perchlorate anions. And to, uh, the way to write that in the molecular equation is to put them together as a compound, but it's understood that they are fully dissolved into ions. There's one problem with this, and that is it's not balanced. Okay? You can see that immediately because I have two, I need two of these uh, chlor uh, perchlorates for magnesium to make it neutral. I only have one here. So I need definitely a two there. I put a two there, but if I do that, I uh, have an issue with the number of H's that I use. There's two here, and there's two there, but there's also another two there. So I need a two in front of the water. And let's check if I do everything right now. Two oxygens, two oxygens, four H H's, four H's, and two perchlorates, two perchlorates. This is right. This is balanced. Right? Make sure you balance the equations right, because if you do calculations with the uh, equation that is not balanced correctly, you get very wrong numbers, because you think sort of more like us. Okay, the, uh, the other part of the question was to write the same equation in terms of the complete ionic. There we go. What I do is, I just split 
this compound into ions. Um, I will show you an example, I think, on um, next Wednesday or so, from previous <coughs> exams where people are trying to do this. And a common mistake, I'm not sure exactly what a mistake comes from, but some, uh, about 10% of people do this, is when I ask you to split this molecular equation into a completely ionic equation, they take each element, H, Cl, and O, and split them all up into aqueous dissolved elements. I've never seen this anywhere in the lecture in the book, but some people do that. I would like to make sure that you are not one of those talks. Okay? If you split something into ions, you can split it into ions. You don't split it into all kinds of elements. Right? That's not the idea of a completely ionic equation. So the ions in perchloric acid are H plus and perchlorate. Right? Perchlorate is an anion. This is the anion. You don't split the anion again into elements. Two H pluses, two perchlorates. Magnesium hydroxide is a solid, so I don't split that in the completely ionic equation because these are bonded, but they're not fully dissolved in solution at this point. However, when this H plus is attacking the OH minuses, it will fall apart. Okay? So this is, this is kind of like relevant to understand. The fact that this is an S doesn't mean that it doesn't react. It does. It's like you throw some solar material in solution. The H pluses will directly attack the OH minuses in the lattice, in the solid lattice, and pluck away these OH minuses, bring them into solution. The rest ions, magnesium, are floating around here. Okay. So what we have, we generate two waters. We know that from here. Magnesium ions and the rest ions, the spectator ions, perchlorate. The last one is the net ionic equation. The only thing you have to do is strike out all the spectator ions. This is a relevant example, okay? Because you are not striking out magnesium. Magnesium appears here, but the ionic form of magnesium is not on this side. So you can't strike out magnesium here, take it out here, and no, it doesn't work. If you cross out spectator ions, they really have to be ions that are fully dissolved and separate, then you cross them out. Okay? So the net ionic equation is this. H plus, magnesium hydroxide is fully here. H2O, magnesium 2 plus. It's there. It's not crossed out. Okay? The only thing that's crossed out is perchlorate, which is appearing here in the same form as it appears over there. Is that clear? Yes. Magnesium hydroxide is a solid. The magnesium ions are not dissolved in solution on this side of the equation. Only after the H plus is reacting with it, they become available as ions in solution. So, you cannot cross out this ion on this side with this bonded ion in the lattice. Okay? You cannot do that. You can only do it as if it's a real spectator ion. The real spectator ion is if it appears fully dissolved in solution on one side and on the other side. Now you'll see this equation here, even though there's a plus here, this is awkward, there's also a two plus here. Two times positive charge is two plus, and a two plus. This equation is fully balanced in terms of the elements and in terms of the charges. So this is a perfectly fine balanced net ionic equation. Okay, let's move on to the following. This person looks like a very capable chemist, and he's doing something here. He has a, some red solution here. It opens up a little valve. It drips into here. And this is beautifully green. This is wonderfully yellow. Actually, I mean, you are in the lab, for real, most solutions have this boring, you know, uh, transparent, and have no color at all. But for photographic opportunities, they're beautifully colored, always. This is just to get you excited about chemistry. <laughs> so what is this person doing? He's doing a titration. What is that? Well, you have this thing here, barrette, and he's dripping something of that stuff that's sitting in here in this beaker till the moment when a certain reaction is taking place and complete, and he can read out on this barrette, which has an indicator on it, how much he used. And he can use that information to quantitatively determine how much of the other stuff is sitting in this beaker. So it's kind of like a quantitative analysis method to find out 
how many ions of a certain kind are in here. Okay? So in terms of acids and bases, this is typically what you use for a neutralization reaction. Let's have a closer look. Here's one. Na NaOH, sodium hydroxide. This is hydrochloric acid. This is the, the two products that form water and sodium chloride in solution. The OH is interacting with the H from the HCl, forming water. So you can do this reaction in the following way. I have, in this particular case, HCl, the acidic solution, in my beaker, and I'm dripping with this barrette the NaOH. That's the basic solution. Okay? And I can control how much I add. So I know exactly how much I add. I know the molarity of this. Think about it. You know the molarity. You know how much volume you apply. Volume times molarity is you know exactly how many moles you add. Okay? This is why it's called and you can see when something happens here. Now, importantly, there's also an indicator. And the indicator tells you exactly when the pH, or the number of H pluses, is dramatically changing. So this will tell you something about whether the reaction is completed or not. There's actually a little movie here that I have. Let's play that. See if it works. All right, I don't know why it doesn't play. Oh, there it is. A titration is a controlled acid-base neutralization reaction. 20 milliliters of hydrochloric acid of an unknown molarity. Oops, sorry. Two drops of indicator dye are added to the acidic solution. This indicator dye is clear in acidic solution and pink in basic solution. The burette is filled with a sodium hydroxide solution of known strength and an initial reading is taken. The base is added to the acidic solution until the solution stays a slightly pink color. At this endpoint, a final reading is taken. The moles of base added equal the moles of acid present. This same reaction can be followed using a pH meter instead of an indicator dot. Initially, the pH changes very little as base is added. Suddenly, the pH changes rapidly as the endpoint passes. The solution quickly becomes very basic, and again, the pH changes very little. The endpoint occurs at this middle point on the curve. All right. So, that is the reaction. Thank you, YouTube. Uh, let me tell you something about the pinkish color that you saw. And, and uh, uh, this is uh, this little this little segment here I'm introducing is two slides long. It's not part of any exam. It's just extra information, just to give you an idea. These are, these things are called indicators. The element that gives it a color are called indicators. These are just molecules that are floating extra in solution, and these molecules can sense what the pH is, how many H plus ions there are. In other words. They assume a different color depending on the concentration of H plus ions in solution. Now I'm going to give you an example of how, how that can work. Okay? Here's one. This is a phenol phthalene indicator. Uh, Here is the structure, it looks a little bit dramatic. But what happens is if the pH, the number of H plus is very high, this part of the molecule will be so-called protonated. There will be an H plus sitting here. Okay? Now, when the solution becomes more basic, that means there's a very high chance that this H plus will come off and not come back. Okay? And if, that, if that's the case, if the H plus goes away, then this unit becomes different. This double bond clicks here. This one clicks there and forms a double bond in this location. That change in molecular conformation leads to uh, pink color of this whole thing. So the molecule li literally changes color because there is an H plus attached to it or not. Okay? So this is how molecules can tell you something about what's going on in solution on the molecular level. All right, so let's do another calculation with this kind of neutralization reaction. So let's say I have, just like the movie, you have NaOH, 
sodium hydroxide in a beaker, okay? And you have 25 milliliters of that stuff, and the molarity is 0.4. And then I want to neutralize the solution with an HCl solution. I have HCl in my burette, okay? And I'm going to add some of this concentration is given to till it is neutralized. The question is, how much do we have to add? What is the volume of this neutralizing acid to neutralize all the OH minus is out? Okay, so let's do this. As always, you would like to understand what is the system that we're talking about. What is going on? So one thing you can do is just to see what kind of ions are there in solution. I have evidently H plus, I have Cl, I have sodium, and I have hydroxide. Then I like to find out what are the actual reactions that's taking place here. Well, this is the reaction we've already seen in several forms. This is the H plus reacting with the OH minus to form water. So this is the net ionic equation. The Cl and the Na are just spectator ions. H plus, one H plus. One part of H plus or one mole of H plus reacts with one mole of OH minus to form one mole of water. One, one, one are your mole ratios. Okay. Now, uh, previously, we, we, the next step would be to determine which one of these guys is the limiting reagent, which one of the reactants. Okay? Our two reactants, H plus and OH minus, which one is the limiting reagent? Um, in this particular case, you probably don't have to do that. <coughs> because the question says we just have to add enough H plus to neutralize all the OH minus. Okay? So that basically means that the OH minus is the limited reagent. You just have to add enough H plus so I have the same amount as the OH minus. I'd like to know the number of moles of OH minus that I have, the number of moles of OH minus that I need to neutralize. <coughs> So how do I do that? Well, uh, I have a volume and I have a molarity. So I take the volume, and V times M equals the number of moles. But this is in, in milliliters, and molarity is in moles per liter. So I convert this very quickly into liters. Okay, 100 milliliters in one liter, ML strikes out. Now this is in liters. And then multiply it with the molarity, 0 0.4. 0 0.4 moles per liter. If I do this operation, I have the number of moles. And it turns out to be a nice number, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of OH minus. This is the amount of OH minus that I have in my beaker. So now I know the number of OH minuses in my beaker. OK. I said already that there's not going to be a limiting reagent here. I just have to add enough H plus to neutralize all these guys. Okay, so I have to know how many H pluses do I need to neutralize 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 mole of OH minus. I need to know the mole ratio between the two. Okay? So for 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of OH minus, I need to multiply by the mole ratio of how these two things react. For each 1 mole of OH minus, I need to need 1 mole of H plus. In other words, I need just the same amount of H pluses that I have. Uh, as I have OH minuses in my, in my beaker. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of H plus. You can do this directly, right? I mean, if you know that they, re they react one to one, you can immediately say, okay, this is how many moles of OH I have. I have, that's exactly how many moles of H plus I have to neutralize it. But if you're not sure, you can always use these mole ratios, which are always right, and always guide you into the right direction. Okay, so this is the number of moles. I need to know our volume. How do we do that? Well, I have the number of moles. I have the molarity. The only missing uh, parameter is the volume. Okay, so I know that V times M equals the amount of moles. I have the amount of moles. I have the molarity, and V is the only unknown. Okay, so these two values are given. This is the molarity of the solution. That is the amount of moles that I need. So if I rearrange this, I find the volume of the solution that contains this many moles of H plus. 
And that is this number uh, divided by this number. 1.0 times 7 minus 2 moles divided by 0 0.13 molarity, and that equals 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 2 liters. This is the volume that contains this many protons to neutralize this many molecular ions. Okay. One more question. Yes. One question. Instead of doing all the six steps, you can just do M1, V1, V2, V2, and just start from the experiment. You can in some cases, but you have to be careful when you apply that formula. This way, you actually approach the problem from an understanding of what you're doing, rather than blindly applying a formula and hoping that it's all right. I want you to understand the problem, and based on understanding, use the right formula. Okay? Okay, another example. Hydrochloric acid is added to barium hydroxide. And luckily for me, the volumes and the molarities are given for each solution. And that means I can immediately get to the number of moles of these things. The question is, what is the concentration of the excess H plus or OH minus ions in solution? So, I throw these two things together. Clearly, this is an acid, hydrochloric acid. Clearly, barium hydroxide is a base. I throw them together, a reaction happens. An acid base reaction happens. The H plus and OH minus react to form water. But then, when the reaction is done, either there's H plus is left or OH minus is left. That's what I have to determine determine which one is left and how much of it is left after the reaction is going to suck. Okay, so again, I started at the very beginning. I just want to see what am I talking about. Here are the ions in solution, H+, plus, CO-, minus, barium 2+, plus, and OH-. Minus. And the reaction that's taking place is, again, the same. H+, plus and OH- minus to form water. CL- minus and the barium are just spectator ions. Okay, so what I really want to know then is how many H pluses do I have? How many OH minuses do I have? And which one of these is the limit in VA? Which one is running out first? Okay, what well, information should be obtainable from the information here? Okay, so here it is. I'm looking at I'm calculating how many H pluses I have from the amount of hydrochloric acid that I have. This is the volume. I convert the volume to liters, and I multiply that by the molarity okay, of HCl. The molarity of HCl is 0.25. I also see immediately that each HCl molecule has one H plus. Okay? So that means if you do this operation for HCl, you have the same amount of H pluses as you have HCl molecules. So what I have after this operation is 1.88 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of HCl, and that's the same as the number of moles of H plus, because each HCl only has one H plus. Number of moles of H plus, number of moles of OH minus, I also need, so let's do that. This is the uh, volume of barium the barium hydroxide solution, it's already in liters. So I just multiply that by the molarity of the solution. And if I do that, I get here the number of moles of barium hydroxide units. But each unit has two OH minuses. So I have to do the following conversion. Convert from the unit of barium hydroxide to number of OH minus. Here, I had one to one. Here I have 2 to 1. Each 1 mole of barium hydroxide produces 2 moles of OH minus because of the substrate 2 here. So that gives me 2.48 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of hydroxide anions in solution. Okay, that's good. <coughs> Next step for me is to determine how these things react. What is the mole ratio and which one is the limit in reagent? You can do this very quick, or you can do it efficiently. The quick way to do is I know they react one to one, H plus or H minus. I have less of H plus and more of OH minus, so the H plus must run out first. H plus must be the limiting reagent. But if you do it the official way, you should find the same thing. So let's just double check. The mole ratio, according to the uh, equation here, is one to one. So the ratio is one. 
And the ratio that I calculate from the actual amounts of the compounds is 1.8 divided by 2.48. I just calculated these numbers, and that is less than 1, meaning the numerator is the one with the reagent. It's exactly what I thought. Okay? So you can always double check whether your intuition was correct. So I take the number of H pluses then and calculate how many OH minus I have left? Because the OH minus is the excess reagent. After the reaction, all the H pluses are gone, but the OH minus is left, but the OH minus is in excess. So the question then is the first part is this one is the reagent, so I only have OH minuses left in solution. How many do I have left? Okay, the first thing I can know is how many have reacted? Well, I know that they react one to one with H plus. This is the amount of H plus. That means this many of OH minuses will react. Okay? So this is what I had in solution previously at the beginning, 2.48 times 10 to the minus 2 moles. That is the total I started with. 1.88 times 10 to the minus 2 moles reacted with H plus in a one to one ratio. So if I subtract these two from one another, I have what I have left in solution in terms of moles. This minus that is the number of moles of OH minus left after the reaction. Okay? This is the number of moles of OH minus. This is the total volume. This volume plus that volume is here. And if you divide the number of moles of OH minus by the total volume, you find the molarity of OH minus. Okay? And that's the real question here. What is the concentration of the excess reagent after the reaction? Okay, that's what I calculated right here. This is the total number of moles. That is the total volume of the solution. The concentration, therefore, is, in this case, 1.8, 1.98 times 10 to the minus 2 molar of OH minus. Okay? Does this make sense? Who feels like I'm not sure about this? What, uh, what, do you, uh, what is the part you're not really sure about? Why is it 5.9? This number here? Yeah. This number is this starting amount of OH minus, number of moles that you have in the beginning, minus the amount that reacted with H plus, is what you have left. This is the amount of moles of OH minus that follows on the subtraction here. That's negative. Yeah, negative, yeah. But this is a small number, right? Uh, this is the number of moles that you have left after the reaction. And this is the total volume. So this must be the more. Okay. I think that's enough. I'll see you next week. <laughs>